Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, web design, freelancing, and more. We're already mostly just sitting at home and watching online classes, so why not learn something tangible and develop your creative side? There's so many lessons on painting, productivity, web development, and a whole slew of other topics that you can't really go wrong with Skillshare. This series on productivity, for example, by fellow future attending physician Ali Abdal, is quite good when you're stuck in a productivity rut. And best of all, Skillshare is quite reasonably priced for us debt-ridden college students. It's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. And if that sounds good, there's an additional kicker. Because Skillshare is sponsoring the video, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So click the link in that description and make this year a productive one. Greetings students and welcome back to another video on quantum mechanics. In the last two videos, I partially solved Schrodinger's equation using separation of variables and discussed the significance of the solutions to the wave function we got from this method. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the significance of these separable solutions by proving a bunch of theorems. Let's start with the first theorem, which states that for normalizable solutions to Schrodinger's equation, the separation constant E must be real. To prove this theorem, we'll suppose that the constant E is a complex number, given by E sub R, which is the real part, plus I times E sub I, which is the imaginary part. Let's now go back to the equation for the wave function psi, which is given by the small psi of x times the time function, the exponential of negative i times e times time over h bar. If we substitute the equation for the complex e, this is what we end up with for psi. We can expand out the term in the parentheses to get this expression, which I'll call equation 1. The normalization condition states that the integral over the real line of psi conjugate times psi must equal 1. Let's now substitute psi and psi conjugate from equation 1 into this normalization condition. We'll start by splitting the exponential terms. These two exponentials with the imaginary number multiply out and go to 1. Meanwhile, these two exponentials with ei come together to give the following. Now, this exponential term can be taken outside the integral because it's only a function of t and we're integrating with respect to x. So we're left with this integral times this exponential. Now this integral is a constant. It's fixed since small psi only depends on x and we're integrating out the x. The exponential term, however, changes with time. But we can't have an exponential changing with time multiplying a fixed constant integral and have that product equal the fixed constant of 1. The only way we can have that is if ei equals 0, in which case the constant e must be real. It cannot have an imaginary component. The fact that E must be real should make sense to you from what we discussed in the previous video regarding the significance of E. If E represents the total energy, then E can only be real. Total energy does not have an imaginary component. The second theorem we'll prove here states that the solution psi of x to the time-independent Schrodinger equation can always be assumed to be real. That doesn't mean it always must be real, it just means that if you have a solution that's got an imaginary component, that solution is just part of a linear combination, which is ultimately real. Let's start the proof by writing down the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is given by the following. I'll call this equation 2. The first step in this proof is to take the complex conjugate of both sides. Small psi here is the only term that's actually complex. h bar and m are constants. The potential function v of x is real, and by the proof of theorem 1, e is also real. So when we take the complex conjugate, here's what we end up with. Now this equation is exactly the same as the time-independent Schrodinger equation, but with the complex conjugate of small psi in there instead of psi. Therefore, we can conclude that the conjugate of small psi also satisfies the time-independent Schrodinger equation, just as small psi itself does. And since the time-independent Schrodinger equation is a linear differential equation, any linear combination of two solutions, in this case small psi and small psi conjugate, is also a solution. Let's suppose that small psi is a complex function with a real part given by small psi sub r and an imaginary part given by small psi sub i, which alone are both real functions. In that case, small psi conjugate will be the same as small psi, just with a minus sign in front of the imaginary part. And as mentioned earlier, if I take a linear combination of small psi and small psi conjugate, the function I end up with is still a solution of the time-independent Schrodinger equation. 
One linear combination I could take is the sum of small psi and its conjugate, which would just give me 2 times small psi r since the imaginary parts cancel. Another linear combination I could take is the imaginary number times small psi minus small psi conjugate. If I do this, you can show that you'll get rid of the small psi r component and just end up with 2 times small psi i. Now both psi r and psi i are real functions, and they both satisfy the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Is it not more convenient then to assume that the solutions to this equation are real by default? Well, of course it's more convenient, and it's also possible too because we've just constructed purely real solutions. So even if I did have a complex solution, I could still use that to construct real solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which means that we can just assume that the solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation are real by default. The third theorem we'll talk about states that if the potential v of x is an even function, then small psi of x can be assumed to be either even or odd. I'll start this proof by copy-pasting equation 2, which is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Judging from the statement of this theorem alone, this equation is probably the most relevant in our proof. And we'll suppose that small psi of x is a solution to this uh, equation. If v of x is an even function, then by definition of even functions, v of x and v of negative x are equal. Let's now replace all the functions of x in equation 2 with functions of negative x to end up with the following. Now we can replace v of negative x with v of x because v is even. In addition, using the chain rule, we can argue that the second derivative of psi of negative x with respect to negative x is the same as the second derivative of psi of negative x with respect to x because the square of the derivative of negative x with respect to x is just 1. If we make these substitutions, here's what we will end up with. Now this is the exact same equation as equation 2, but with psi of negative x in there instead of psi of x. We can therefore say that if v is an even function, and small psi of x is a solution to time-independent Schrodinger, small psi of negative x is also a solution. If both small psi of x and negative x are solutions, then these two linear combinations, their sum and their difference, are also solutions. This first linear combination is an even function. You can show this. If you replace x by negative x, then you get psi of negative x plus psi of negative of negative x, which is just psi of negative x plus psi of x, which is the exact same thing as psi of x plus psi of negative x. So that should convince you this is an even function. The second linear combination you can show is an odd function. If you replace x by negative x, you'll get psi of negative x minus psi of negative of negative x, which is just psi of negative x minus psi of x, which is negative of psi of x minus psi of negative x. That's a mouthful. So that should convince you this is an odd function. Since we can construct even and odd solutions to time-independent Schrodinger in the event of an even potential, we have proven this theorem. If the potential v of x is an even function, then small psi of x can be assumed to be either even or odd. The final theorem we'll discuss in this video says that e must be greater than the minimum value of the potential v of x for every normalizable solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. The normalizable bit here is key. In the proof of this theorem, I'll copy-paste equation 2 again, but immediately after, I'm going to rearrange this equation to isolate the second derivative of small psi with respect to x. Now, if the minimum value of the potential v is greater than the total energy e, then this term in the parentheses is always positive. In addition, the constant out front is also always positive. And as a result, the second derivative of small psi and small psi itself must both have the same sign. They're either both positive or they're both negative. I'm going to show that this function, where the function and its second derivative have the same sign, that this function is not normalizable. And I'm going to show this using three graphical cases. First, let's look at what happens if psi were positive by drawing the set of axes. If psi were positive, then the second derivative is also positive. So the derivative of psi is constantly increasing. Psi is concave up. So if we have psi starting out up here, its derivative is going to continue increasing. If it keeps increasing, psi gets further and further away from the x-axis. But remember, it's supposed to approach zero at negative infinity and positive infinity. Otherwise, it's not normalizable. Even if the derivative starts out negative, and it's not so negative that psi falls below the x-axis, then because the derivative is increasing, we will eventually reach a point where psi 2 will start to increase without bound. And this function clearly is not normalizable. 
Now let's look at what happens if psi were negative. If psi were negative, then its second derivative is also negative. So the derivative of psi is constantly decreasing, or psi is concave down. So if we have psi starting out down here, its derivative is going to continue decreasing. If it keeps decreasing, psi gets further and further away from the x-axis. Because it's supposed to approach zero at negative infinity and positive infinity to be normalizable, this function is not normalizable. Even if the derivative starts out positive and it's not so positive that psi goes above the x-axis, then because the derivative is decreasing, we will eventually reach a point where psi 2 will start to decrease without bound. And this function clearly is not normalizable. If we look at the final scenario where the function does happen to cross the axes because its derivative has a large enough magnitude, then even if it crosses the axes, it never comes back. If we start out positive and we go to the negative side, then psi continues to fall into oblivion. If we start out negative and go to the positive side, then we continue to rise up into the heavens. In any scenario, we cannot have a normalizable function as long as the potential is always greater than e. And this proves the theorem. And these graphical arguments should hopefully convince you why this proof is true. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, we're going to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for special cases, starting with the infinite square well. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan signing out.